My Drone X event, I think would be one of the best platforms that we have because number one, we have many aspects of the event. You're bringing all the players, all the stakeholders that we talked about, uh, be it the experts, companies, corporations, clients, uh, service providers, academias, all in one place to talk about drones and what it can do. Having an event, the My Drone X, it gives an opportunity for uh, people to become more aware, right? Uh, and, and from awareness, it, we, we hope that it will lead to adoption. You can expect to learn and unlearn a lot of things regarding drone tech. The Malaysian industry for drone is growing uh, rapidly. Uh, most of it, um, um, companies, uh, in terms of Malaysian companies providing drone services, utilizing uh, drones that are imported from outside, and also moving towards manufacturing and assembling Malaysian made drones. The drone tech industry globally is worth. 127 billion USD, and that is based on study done by PwC. Uh, of course, I think it will also have a huge impact to Malaysia in the sense that um, harnessing the power of drone tech, it enables us to actually do things better, do it faster as well as do it cheaper. So a very good morning uh, to our esteemed panelists here. My name is Navin on behalf of the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC. We are pleased to have our esteemed partners from uh, Mata Aerotech, uh, Polar Drone, and also Aerodyne, the drone tech industry specialists. Some of them uh, are very, very eager to share on what they have here for you guys to, to know more about drone tech and how can we catalyze the adoption of drone tech for the agriculture sector. So agriculture sector is something very, very close to all our hearts. Of course, we eat to live. Uh, I wish I can say the other one, but yeah, but we eat to live. Okay, so so the Malaysian agriculture, just a little bit of history for, for the rest. The Malaysian agriculture sector contributed 7.3% uh, back in 2018. That amounts to 99.5 billion. So people can say, oh, okay, uh, but that is not uh, a okay. The reason, why, the reason why is because about 20 years ago, the GDP contribution of agriculture to the Malaysian sector, Malaysian economy was a double, 15.8%. Today, we are down by half. Uh, if nothing is to be done to the sector, uh, probably another 10 years down the road, we will be half to 7.3, that's about 3.5, which is really bad. Hence why digital plays a very, very important role uh, to address the challenges in the agriculture sector via drone tech, for example, uh, especially during this challenging pandemic moment. So, without without the long history of that, uh, let me further introduce uh, my friends from the industry here. So, JX from Polar Drone. Uh, so, JX is actually the uh, founder and CEO of Polar Drone. Okay, so JX runs... Uh, Polar drone operations all around uh, Malaysia, uh, which is he's actually based in Cyberjet, very close to MTech, uh, and Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, he was actually recognized as Forbes Asia under 30 recipient for Polar drones work in the agriculture sector. Now, the very, very interesting part about JX has, is that he is actually a certified remote pilot, yeah, not for Malaysian Airlines, but under the Civil Aviation Safety Authority Australia. He holds a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering. So, and wonderfully, to date, Polar Drone has actually mapped 500 hectares of agriculture land. So for Malaysians, yes. So, so agriculture land, yeah. So for Malaysians who, who think that drone is pretty uh, new, no, they have drawn, they alone have drawn more than 500 hectares of agriculture land mapping, yeah. Now, moving on, we have Randall, our very cheerful friend, from Malaysia, but he looks very Taiwanese because most of the time he <laughs> manages businesses in Taiwan. So he graduated from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, of which a Bachelor of Information Technology majoring in multimedia and advising, uh, advertising. He's old, he was also the regional manager for MTouch uh, Technology, responsible for operations in six nations, covering technology innovation, which actually brings him to his next, uh, next passion, which is on drone technology. So I'm going to let Randall talk about that a little bit after this. Uh, of course, last but not least, 
uh, we have Razwan, uh, the senior vice president of Aerodyne, a very unique name. Now, with 14 years of experience in projects across digital transformation, uh, his current main focus is around the space of telecommunication, power, energy, oil and gas. Uh, he's also responsible for setting up Aerodyne Australia. And yes, to, to, to just shout out again, Aerodyne has presence in Australia. Yes. So uh, he manages across Asia, Pacific, United States, Latin America, and the list actually goes on. So rather than me shouting out for them, it's always best that I let them talk. So with that, I'm going to hand over the stage for exactly two minutes to uh, Randall first because he's smiling. So Randall, a quick introduction about uh, Mata Aerotech, a uh, very quick one. Uh, and sure then thing. Go Good morning, Navin. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am uh, Randall. Uh, I am one of the directors and founders at uh, Mata Aerotech. So Mata Aerotech, we are a drone uh, manufacturer company. Uh, we partnered with our partners, Geosat Technologies from Taiwan. And we are just over a year old here in Malaysia. Uh, but uh, within that year, we've uh, devoted ourselves and tried our best to sort of get our footing within the agriculture sector uh, here in Malaysia, where we've uh, been doing quite a lot of work with the paddy community um, in Malaysia, uh, particularly up in Kedah and Perak. Uh, we've been uh, quite active working and engaging with some of the, uh, quite fortunate in fact, to work with some of the biggest names in the paddy industry, particularly uh, names like Falkra, Berhad, with their gigantic uh, plantation up in um, in uh, Barak in uh, Tuluk Intan, so you know we've been helping them doing our spraying works as well as uh, working together on how we can actually bring in new solutions uh, to the paddy industry as well as also their oil palm uh, sector. Cool. Um, yeah, and also one of our newest clients is actually Nestle. Uh, we've been working with the Nestle Paddy Club initiative up in Gouda uh, just this past season so far so it's uh, it's been a very interesting experience so far thank you thank you uh, one thing i like about randall although i told him two minutes he made it in 1.5 minutes so <laughs> wonderful <laughs> so next moving on we have jx a very interesting company called Poladro. uh jx over to you yeah, good morning everyone uh thanks for being here today so as Nobin mentioned i'm jx I'm the founder and ceo of Poladron. Uh, in Polar Drone, what we do, of course, we are a drone tech company and we focus a lot on the agriculture se sector, in particularly the analytics and the automation sector. So on the analytics front, uh, we didn't map only 500 hectares, it's actually 500,000 hectares that we mapped. And that was uh, late last year. So to date, we've covered around 800,000 hectares of land already, uh, which we can confidently say we are one of the largest, uh, we have the largest database of oil palm plantations uh, in Malaysia right now. Uh, because most of it primarily is in the oil palm in the plantation. Um, so in terms of the analytics, what we do for the estates, of course, is to help them monitor what's happening on the ground, um, identify where's the problem areas, and of course, to recommend what kind of decisions and actions they need to take after we map the area. And that led to the automation where um, a lot of estates came up to us and told us it's good for them to know where is the problem in the field, but they simply do not have enough workers to address the problems. And because for that, we started looking at how do we apply automation tech through drones onto oil palm plantations as well. And we've recently launched a very precise spot spraying drone called Oryctus, used to target the rhino beetles problem in, rhino, in the oil palm plantations, whereby after planting for the entire oil palm industry, for the first three years, they would have to perform fortnightly spraying on every single oil palm. So if you can imagine the scale of our oil palm industry, about 6 million hectares, for the first three years after replanting, it's a huge area that needs to be sprayed. And that's where our new product is targeted at. Um, so that being said, we also have an office in Thailand where we focus again a lot on agriculture. The paddy industry over in Thailand is about easily 20 times larger than Malaysia. So that's where we are focused on right now, in more on paddy in Thailand. Not so much in Malaysia because uh, unfortunately our industry in Malaysia, which I'll talk a bit about more, it's a bit slower than in Thailand and Vietnam, surrounding countries. Cool. Thank you so much, Jax. Thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have Razwan scratching his moustache because he wants to speak. So, Razwan, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Navin. Good morning, everyone. So, Aerodyne um, is a drone service provider company. 
So um, we, uh, I think we are very proud to call ourselves also a DT3 company. So what DT3 is essentially is a drone technology, data technology for digital transformation. So what we mainly do is, you know, for we go and uh, capture data, you know, and then we process and then we um, deliver to the digital content to our client. So that's in a nutshell what DT3 is. Well, we have been in the market since um, 2014. It has been uh, a cool, interesting, exciting, and also challenging five to six years. Yeah. So um, we are very excited also um, for years ahead. Um, we are a true blue uh, Malaysian company, right? So we are in 32 countries. Yeah. Very close to my heart right now is Indonesia. I am also um, uh, with my colleagues uh, in Indonesia, my Indonesia counterparts, we um, set up and um, two uh, operations over in Indonesia and agriculture is, um, you know, uh, uh, is, is one of our key priority areas. You know, uh, we are currently number three in the world. So that's also another uh, thing that we want, uh, that we are really proud of, right? So we take pride in carrying Malaysian flag you know, and um, some of the countries that we have major operations um, in like US, you know, uh, Middle East, you know, and, and last but not least, Indonesia as well. So those are, um, I would say, the currently what we are doing. And right now, we have been doing agriculture. We've been doing that since 2018, probably not as, as much as uh, Polar Drone, but uh, we have been doing some um, pockets of work here and there. Uh, but right now we are focusing, we have a laser sharp focus looking at agriculture right now. So um, yeah, so uh, we hope to be uh, one of the good players, um, similar to my respective uh, um, analysts uh, over here today. Cool. Thank you so much, Razwan. So thank you so much. That is the overview of Polar Drone, Mata Aerotech and Aerodyne. So let's move on to the matters today. First question, of course, to Randall, because he's like, okay. Come on, ask me. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, so Randall. Now, agriculture, like I said, uh, it's a very, very traditional sector. Mm. So uh, it's number one, mindset change. Number two, uh, the perspective. Yeah, because it's the older generation. There are many, many, uh, I wouldn't say the word problem because it's very negative. There are many, many uh, issues that we would need to address via digital means. So, for, I mean, you know more about uh, paddy plantation, yeah? From your experience, what are the current uh, issues faced by agriculture or paddy plantation per se? Good question, Avin. Thanks. Um, well, definitely, I think when we talk about agriculture in, in, in a general sense, there's, there's always uh, pain points and, and challenges that they face. Uh, especially, it's, it's a very bone-breaking work to work in the paddy field, especially traditionally. So, um, you know, when we, when we were engaging with, uh, with a lot of the farmers, local farmers, before we even engaged with the larger uh, estate groups, um, such as Falkra, you know, we've talked to a lot to smaller farmers and one of the biggest issues that they face currently is actually just the simple labor shortage, local labor shortage. Um, you know, when we talk about trying to actually uh, create efficiency, trying to, uh, you know, talk about yield improvements, the first thing that actually comes to it is who's going to do the job? Who's actually going to come in and actually support farmers who, who want to increase their yields, who want to have fantastic uh, estate plans? Um, and, you know, there's only so much um, you can do, especially when, you know, we have this sort of culture amongst the uh, younger generation that agriculture is sort of a very, no, I wouldn't say dirty, but I would say very tiring work you know it's a lot of effort and it's it, it's it's been perceived for a very long time as low pay or even uh, bad returns of money um but i think that's that's a that's a large misconception particularly um amongst us who are living in sort of urban environment uh, rural communities are hard-working people and you know they're, they're definitely uh interested to modernize their own sort of uh estates and plantations here and there not just in paddy um, so focusing more on the paddy issues, you know, um, uh, of course, uh, you know, with the actual shortage of labor at hand, um, you know, the, the traditional methods, for example, of uh, spraying, I'll talk about spraying and then I'll talk about more of the data after. 
So when we talk about spraying here, um, you know, we the traditional methods, you have two methods of spraying. You have the power sprayers, which are giant tractors, and they have big, big jets, and it goes in a team of three to four people to spray off all of the agrochemicals. And then you have the manual sprayers, which is the majority of people in um, who are smallholders and smaller plantations, two hectares or so, right? And these are the people who are manually spraying and they're using maybe about 40 to 80 liters of spraying. And it takes them about three hours to two hours to spray one hectare. And then you have the, the power jet teams, which are about 45 minutes. And they're walking through the field. They're, they're actively um, you know, surrounded by agrochemicals. We're talking about pesticides, herbicides. Uh, you know, these, these are pretty nasty stuff. So definitely when, when, when we were doing all our research and sort of trying to understand the industry, right, we realized that, look, Jones is realistically the only logical option. We're taking, we're creating first and foremost efficiency uh, by using, you know, one of the biggest things that we talk about when we're talking to farmers is about education. Um, you know, we use about 16 liters for one hectare of paddy for pesticide spraying, right? That's just enough for our drone platform currently. Well, we are improving, but that's what we currently use. And farmers will go, I, I've been using 80 liters of agrochemical solutions for the past 15, 20 years. You know, why, why 16 liters? And that's when you start talking about, you know, talking to agronomists, you start talking to chemical manufacturers. And it's a lot of it comes down to data-driven results. You know, over, over chemical application can lead to mismanagement of health for your paddy plantations. So, you know, I, I, if you ask me realistically, uh, you know, that's one issue. And then you have, of course, trying to uh, educate the, the young to get into drone tech. It's, it's an interesting, interesting industry. They're definitely interested. There's a lot of interest from, uh, from people to join our ATP program, which is our training program at Mata. Um, and, you know, to us, uh, you know, it's, it's trying to get people who have that mindset of wanting to improve. Um, if you ask me, the biggest challenge is also uh, sort of trying to introduce more of the data analytics side, particularly when you talk to Paddy. Um, you know, in Malaysia, we've, we've historically had about, what, uh, our yields are between four to three tons per hectare, um, which you could compare on, on the ASEAN level far below the, com the competitive rate. You know, countries like Thailand and Indonesia and Vietnam are producing seven to eight tons yield per hectare. So this directly does affect the ability for farmers to earn uh, sustainable income. Um, so drone tech does come in sort of as a way to um, I wouldn't say bridge, but sort of kickstart. There's a lot of things that need to go into uh, into sort of revitalizing the the paddy industry or agriculture industry for that matter. Um, but I would I definitely do believe that drone tech comes in as sort of the uh, the starting point. We're talking about right. labor shortage replacements, um, creating sort of long term data to assist with planning, health management, and this all these factors eventually help to uh, create better yields for farmers. Great, great. Uh, so, technology, technically speaking, uh, using drone tech, you mentioned that you should be able to look at uh, improved yield, of course, yes. increased participants, uh, yep. reduce of operational cost, because yep. now with drone, you don't need 10 workers running around, what, 20 acres of land, right? Precisely. So, now for the farmer's perspective, the first thing that they would want to hear is, uh, of course, how much of improvement of productivity can I get? How much of better income or returns can I get? Because end of the day, uh, it's all about uh, to improve your livelihood. Yeah. So yeah, great. Uh, great that you highlighted that. Uh, moving on to JX. JX, you actually mentioned that uh, Thailand agriculture sector in terms of space. Yeah, it's about twenty times more, uh, yeah. roughly. For paddy. For paddy. Yes. Now you also recently launched this uh, drone on Oryctis, right? Uh, how do you think? that would help the, the paddy industry as a whole? Yep. Or, or so, do you have any success stories that you could tell us, maybe 30%, 20%? I mean, correct. I okay, so the Oryctus drone, it's a drone that is actually specifically targeted for our oil palm industry instead of the paddy industry. Hmm. And the reason why we developed for the Malaysian oil palm industry is obviously because the total hectare rich for the oil palm industry is significantly bigger than the paddy industry in Malaysia. 
and also that the commercial players for oil palm, they have a lot more money, more money to invest in technology. So that's a big difference when we speak about large-scale corporate plantations for oil palm versus the paddy market. Um, they are dealing with a slightly different set of problems as well, where paddy farmers, just some numbers for perspective, the average household income is about 1,900 ringgit per month in Malaysia, which is significantly lower than the median income. Whereas if you talk about your plantations like Saim Davi, Gunting plantations, they're making millions and millions every year. Um, so it's a complete different kind of um, problems that they are facing. In terms of the agri plantations, problems that we are dealing with, one of the main problems is, of course, the over-reliance on foreign labor, where if you look at the plantation agriculture industry, Malaysia employs, the industry employs about 11% of the labor workforce in Malaysia, local Malaysian workforce, but we em they employ up to 40% of the foreign labor workforce. So that's a huge difference and a skill where um, it's not sustainable in the long run. And mainly, so that's the reason why uh, technology, it's, it's quite hard to roll out technologies into the estates, into the plantations, mainly because they rely on foreign labor, which is cheap um, and it's readily available. So the, that's the best thing and one of the blessings of MCO, where plantations and agriculture players right now, they start to realize, hey, um, we can't rely on this anymore. And a lot of estates, they're reporting to us that they have a shortage of labor of up to 50% compared to pre-MCO, wow. which they're not, this is probably going to last through next year. Um, so they have to, and they're forced to innovate right now. So that's where Orictus comes in for the oil palm plantations. There are a few things that require a lot of labor for plantations. And the first one, it's of course going to be on application of pesticides. Like I mentioned, for the first three years of a oil palm plantation, it's a 25 year cycle. They would have to, traditionally people with manual backpacks would go out and spray every single palm every fortnight. So that's a 26 time cycle every single year that needs to be sprayed throughout the whole estate, which um, is thousands and thousands of hectares. If you imagine and you multiply that up to the number of people for the industry, it easily goes up to tens of thousands of labor required. So that's where we are coming in um, with our spraying drone, which utilizes, we already patented this unique technology, positioning technology that allows us to automatically have the drone go out and do precise centimeter level spraying on each individual oil palm tree. So that's the novel technology that we are using. And the second thing about Arictus as well is with the support of MDAG Plus, thank you for that. Um, we managed to localize a lot of the components instead of importing technology. We used to import, and we are a distributor for DJI as well. We used to import a lot of their drones for um, agriculture, for mapping, enterprise usage. But the big problem we realized for agriculture, technology, and machinery is if you tell and some of you that the agriculture drone, spraying drones does not break down, they are lying to your face. It will break down and it's all about maintenance and support that we do. So one of the big challenge when we import drones in, it can be cheap if you buy in volume, but it's always the spare part and after sales that kills you. So that's where we started to localize a lot of uh, components and that's where our returns comes in, where we localize a lot of the, uh, more importantly, the internal electronics, which is the one that is expensive to replace. Um, so right now, the whole internal electronics of Orictus is fully built by us. Uh, we control the firmware, which means that we are able to customize it to what the clients want, um, different specific software and so on. Yeah. And also, of course, the what the drone is built for the oil palm industry specifically, we are also implementing that because the technology and the frame is the same for the battery industry. So we are passing on the cost benefit as well to the yeah. industry itself. Yep. Actually, JX very well pointed that uh, comparing to paddy land side, right? Yep. Uh, palm oil is very much bigger, yep. which is very much uh, effective if you use drone because of the, the coverage area and the number of manpower you need to manage and spray and all that. Yep. So, uh, good job on the palm oil industry, but of course, this is just the beginning to, to many more success stories by you guys. So, Richard Oswald, I know he's probably stretching his head like, yeah, I got to talk now. So, uh, yeah, you've been in Australia, you've been in Malaysia. So, my question right now is, now, when you start drone technology, right, so why agriculture sector and why not other sectors? I mean, you said you have a, a, a sharp focus on agriculture. Why? Okay, right. So, I think, um, let me just 
also start with well, Aerodyne doesn't just look at agriculture. Agriculture is one of our key verticals at uh, the right. moment. So, um, so agriculture, um, so uh, apart from just doing agriculture, you know, we do a lot of and that is our DNA as well, right? So as inspection, we do a lot of uh, the power lines, those uh, electrical assets, those telco towers, that is part of the gas sector as well, um, is, is part of our being as an product, so that core businesses, right? So um, agriculture, uh, because we said this, I think we are quite fairly new in, in agriculture. We started in 2018, was um, most of our activity. We do a bit of business uh, in Indonesia, in Australia, uh, and also, um, also with uh, major clients oil power here as well. So we did all that, right? So um, I think one of the key things that we realize, you know, one of the key things to be successful in agriculture is it in a VLS, very large scale, right? So when doing VLS, you know, the, th the key thing behind this is, you know, if you want to go far, you, you go alone, right? If you want to go far, you go to Yeah. You want to go one. So our approach is we, we will do it in a very large scale. Very large scale, it means essentially is we want to enable ecosystem to services to potential clients, to the farmers, you know, the plantation estates, but also how then we enable other partners, other grown companies, you know, uh, probably the smaller ones to also leverage uh, Aerodyne to go providing this agriculture services to, to our clients. So we are approaching it um, uh, quite in a uh, sort of in a different way for, for agriculture. So we want to provide to the client that common platform for all the uh, drone service providers, you know, to offer their services um, to the plantation owners, to the farmers. So imagine, you know, so imagine one farmer in Tanjung Karang, you know, so he want, he has about 10 hectares of uh, uh, paddy fields and he wants to do spraying. So he just go on to that platform, he just ordered that kind of place and then drone service, that, 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 that service provider comes and do the spraying. Right? So we, we, we want to introduce that kind of easiness, right? That kind of transparency for, 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 for the farmers, for the plantation estate to order or to, to get these agricultural services. Because mind you, drone is, is quite an expensive asset, I mean, at least at this point of time, right? So for every farmer to actually go and buy drone, yeah, that's a, a tremendous cost point uh, for, for, for the farmers, right? So you, you buy or you procure or you get this kind of services, you know, through, through drone uh, companies like us, you know, the drone companies like, uh, you know, the, 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 the smaller ones that, that we have um, across the state. We did, um, you know, uh, we, again, we are, we, are, we are trying this out. We are trying, we are on solution phase uh, still, but we, we did the trials at Tanjung Kara, you know. So after we did that, um, you know, uh, using drones for petty spraying, we can see that, you know, some of the villagers, you know, some of the, they've already started drone themselves, you know. So we can already see like few, uh, probably a, a small service providers uh, offering this kind of services. So what do they need, the service providers? So, so they, they need a platform, um, the market uh, demand, the demand platform, right? So this demand platform is what we are trying to do at the moment. So we're trying to solve, we're trying to entangle this um, market uh, perspective, you know, to, 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 uh, to make it easier for uh, DSPs like us, you know, um, to offer this kind of services uh, to, to the farmers. So I think that's very high in our agenda at the moment. We, we hope to, uh, currently we are actively developing this one and then we hope to turn it around um, as, as soon as possible, right? 
great, great. Thank you so much. I just want to add a bit sure. for sure, Dr. Razwan. Um, in fact, this sharing economy ecosystem, right? It's already, if you think about it, happening in a, in somewhat in the agriculture industry. If you think about tractors, um, yeah. so it's very common with tractors for large companies to have huge, huge fleets of tractors and they go around offering services to farmers and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's, I, I really, I heard about this uh, plan from Aerodyne already and I think it's a really good thing for the industry because then it allows the farmers to gain access to equipment at a lower cost than what they would. They wouldn't be able to afford the whole unit, obviously. Mm -hmm. And if you look at in Thailand as well, where we're involved with, there is a local company over there called Gao Rai that they do the same thing for um, sharing economy, having an app where the farmers can just call and then they will come up with their team of spraying drones and perform the spraying actions for the farmers. So that's something that works very well in Thailand right now. So there's no reason why it shouldn't work in Malaysia. Of so course, that's a good of course. Step, yeah. Now, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, in terms of agriculture, right? We are, we are somewhat uh, the same. I mean, we face the same common problem statements and I guess uh, it can be rectified with the same solution. Yeah. So uh, like Razwan and uh, uh, GX mentioned, right? Now, mentality of, uh, I would say, not farmers alone, but the community as a whole is the moment you see a drone tech, they will go like, oh, I need to buy a drone. And like Razwan pointed out, buying a drone is actually quite pricey. Uh, but again, that is not the right mentality because nowadays it's not about buying drone. You do not need to buy a drone to use a drone technology. No, you can actually procure that as a service. Like JX said, uh, you need someone to spray. So you can call these companies and then they will deploy the drone and you pay them by the service or by the number of acres you spray. So you do not need to, to buy a drone which you would need to maintain and all that. So service is a much more feasible uh, approach to farmers. Of course, we are talking about small scale farmers as well. So I think it's a very great idea rather than selling drones, it's the idea of selling a service because now, we are looking at delivering impact at scale. You want more and more farmers to know about drone technology, how cost effective is it to procure via services, and how much can they optimize or improve their productivity with drone technology. That's what, uh, that's what we want to drive. Uh, we have been driving together with you guys, and that's what we want to drive moving on also. So, Randall, uh, questions for you. Sure. Uh, sure. The paddy guy. <laughs> not just petty, not just petty. Of course, yes, petty. See, see, sometimes when I, when I mention here, those, those are your focus, that's where you started yeah. on. But of course, uh, like Razwan said, drone tech is not only for agriculture, no, but uh, it's the beginning. We're talking about agriculture, so see. expand it all. You, you, are, you do not use sensors for one, set, uh, one sector alone, you use it cross. That's, that's the same thing with drone technology. Now, based on your drone technology, right, uh, what are the available solutions for the bloody plantation? Or oh, means spraying, mapping. Mm -hmm. What are the available solutions by uh, your side, uh, Mata? Sure. Uh, definitely, I think when we talk about technology in general, I, I, I take quite a pragmatic approach when I talk about drone tech. Um, you know, I, I like to compare drones to how um, the CNC came in for engineering, right? Traditionally, things were very hand done but then you have computer powered manufacturing process where you can use a CNC machine to create tools, right? In a way, I do treat drones very much as an engineering tool. It's an amazing product um, that can assist, but it's not, I wouldn't call it the be all and all um, of, of, of particularly in the case of agriculture, it's not gonna be the final solution. Um, you know, robotics and automation are great to, to do things but they can always be improved. Engineering is a process of upgrading and improving upon what you build. Um, but there has to be something more solid. When we talk about stuff like data analytics, AI, big data, you know, I do feel that these are components that um, not, just, not just are they important, but they are part of that ecosystem. Um, you know, reporting on health, reporting on the status of things, uh, which is what IoT technology has been doing uh, for quite some time, um, it is part and parcel of the, the process of getting drone tech into the ecosystem. 
Um, so like when we talk about products that I do, uh, we, have, we have our drones. We have our, we use a helicopter format drone called the Alpas 2. Um, and that's a drone that we have been, um, you know, pushing out here in Malaysia. But, you know, at the same time, um, I also have other drones that can also assist the paddy industry or for the matter, the greater agriculture industry um, through imaging, through data collection and research. Um, I mean, these are all quite uh, typical and quite well-known techs amongst the drone tech community anyway. Um, but when we start talking about AI, we start talking about big data and processing information, that's where the true value of, of, yeah. of uh, drone tech comes in. Um, you know, how we were able to, for example, uh, report the health or the processing time of, uh, of, of mapping out a thousand hectares. Um, you know, we, we recently did a, a 500 hectare project with, uh, with uh, in, in, in Perak um, about four months ago, uh, five months ago, roughly. And we processed out that within um, three days, two days, in fact, less. Well, from sending it over to Taiwan and getting the information back. Um, you know, but these are some of the things where, uh, you know, as a sort of experiment for us, but if you were to compare that to the traditional method of auditing your plantations and mapping it out, you know, we're talking about 500 hectares easily could take you about a couple months, two, three months, four months, maybe, yeah. you know, and that's, that's sort of the manual process. And so saving on that time uh, is, is fast becoming sort of the, the standard required for most plantations to run efficiently. Um, you know, there's, it's not about, I don't think uh, drone tech is trying to really reinvent any wheel, but we're trying to add value or sort of create efficiencies within what has already been there. Um, and, and that's what I feel, you know, when I talk about drone tech, I like to, comp I like to actually include both of these aspects, the automation part and also the, uh, the digitalization part and data in general. Um, you know, but in terms of how you want to apply drone tech, I think it's definitely something which is extremely wide applications. Yeah. When we talk about, um, you know, data collection methods, you know, everyone uses um, some form of RGB camera or some sort of geothermal or some LiDAR even as a sensor tech. Um, but, you know, the, in, in our own group as well, in, in, in our own experiences, we've used drones to actually communicate with uh, IoT sensors because, you know, when we're talking about land stretches that are thousands of yeah. hectares, right? It's simply not practical to, uh, to include uh, networking and, 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 and expecting good signal, especially in rural communities, you know, where there is a lot of infrastructure development still ongoing. So how can, how can companies like us come in? You know, um, IoT technology has been around for a long time. Um, you know, and, and it's all sorts of forms, nitrogen sensors, ground soil analysis, um, you know, uh, disease management. Um, and drones have come in sort of as the physical option of bridging that gap. So one of our experiences was using our drones to actually, um, we were working with a oyster farm out in Taiwan. And, uh, you know, these people, they're out in sea. So um, they put special sensors that help to, to monitor algae buildup, but you know, they're not expecting to have signal or, or connectivity out there. So it was more cost effective and actually much more logical to use drones as sort of the bridge to communicate between um, you know, where their farm base was to fly out and collect that data and bring it back rather than manually going out there and extracting that data and then processing it back. It can be all done very seamlessly. But these are just some of the examples I believe drone tech can add value in terms of products and services. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of it requires thinking out of the box, I would say, to add real value to the very traditional methods that have been done in agriculture particularly. Randall, thank you so much. Uh, now, to, to the viewers out there, uh, one thing that uh, Randall mentioned that I would want, really want to highlight. So the moment you tell anyone a drone technology, in your mind, number one is cost. Yeah, number two, which now you can do it, you can procure it via service. Number two, in our mind, oh, drone is about uh, flying and then you spray, you map. No, uh, that mindset is again wrong because drone is not about just spraying and monitoring and mapping. Uh, it's not. Like, like Randall said, uh, maybe I can get 10 workers to, to uh, spray for 10 acres of plantation. 
But now with drone, of course, it's far more effective. That is one. Number two, mapping is also more accurate. I'm just giving you some of the list, of the many. Yeah? Now, the most fundamental part is the data and the AI part. Now, when you say data, now, of course, now, uh, uh, the workers can go on and spray wherever they want to spray, wherever required to spray. But with drone, you are specifically meant, you are able to monitor the frequency of spraying, the volume of spraying, you're able to get real-time data on the soil mapping, whether there's enough irrigation, whether there's enough fertigation. Uh, for example, pineapple plantation, it's in a terrain. So irrigation has issues in certain areas. So you're able to map all that. Now, there's a big difference between a, a human's eye and, and a machine, which is far more accurate. I mean, it's a fact. Yeah, it's a fact. So these data are what is important because now a, a very simple logic. If I am a, if I'm a farmer, I'm able to know how much I should spray or how frequent I should spray. If I have the data, that will also reduce my operational cost because I could avoid wastage of spray. Okay, I can also plan for my upcoming months. I can plan for my plantation ahead. Now, that, that is the, the big part of uh, drone tech uh, to, to all of you guys. It's not about just spraying and mapping. No, it's far more than that. So uh, this, this message has to go out very, very clearly because drone has uh, a great opportunity, but it's also for people to know that the drone is not only about the free scope. It can do far more. And uh, I'm very sure Razwan is going to say, drones can also use to fly parcels. I mean, like you guys have seen that in newspapers and all that. Now, now, while what that is not available in Malaysia, probably not yet, but drone can also inspect, okay? Uh, drone can monitor in real time because when you plug in a camera, you, while sitting in your house, you're able to monitor all that real time data and you can do precision for the next upcoming months for your operational. That's where we talk about traditional operational costs. Now, with that, uh, GX, based on, on, on your 500,000, before and your 800,000 hectares of plantation, palm oil plantations uh, spring, right? What, what were the expected outcomes? What were the outcomes that you've got? Maybe you want to tell people so that they know via drone, what can they get? Yep. So talking about the um, how we got to this stage of having 800,000 hectares of data in our database, it obviously wasn't easy. It was a four, three, four years process where when we started, it was just picture this is a very typical kind of meeting room where I walk in, I'm a, I was 24 back then. And then you would have people that are in their 60s, 70s, the VPs of the estates, of corporate estates that have been in the industry for 50 years, double of my age, looking at me and saying, uh, what do these guys know about plantations? So that has always been the case. And that's where we sat down and be really realistic. We know about drones. We have no idea about estates compared about you guys. And let's sit down and work together in terms of how do we um, implement drones and how do we collect information that is relevant to them, to their estates. So that's where we started this whole journey. And then uh, fortunately, um, we built solutions that they wanted because we listened to them and built exactly what they asked for. And from there, it just went on and on and on. So like you mentioned rightly just now, the kind of insights that estates often look at is if you think about drones, they are just a platform that flies and carries a camera or a sensor on board. So the main benefit of that is you would have to collect data over a large area of land and that's the agriculture industry as a whole. Quite often we are dealing with large area of land. Um, first of all, paddy for small orders is a bit different, but on in just generalizing it, it's always over a big area of land. Um, they would want to know what's happening on the ground. So monitoring is always one, but more importantly, apart from um, the improving use and so on, the plantations recently have also identified intangible benefits, such as like you rightly mentioned, um, when they perform pesticide spraying, they want to measure exactly how many ml per palm it's been sprayed, um, where has it been sprayed, what date, what time, by who, and all this information is extremely crucial because we are talking and moving into the um, SDG goals right now, the Sustainable Development Goals, where we would need proper traceability of our food sources. And drones are one of the main benefits, I mean, that's one of the main benefits that drones can bring in compared to manual uh, workers. And this kind of cost is intangible because the developing nations, um, Europe, where they are purchasing a lot of our palm oil, 
they are getting increasingly concerned about the sustainability of our industries. And this is a thing that we have to do or else that will be a massive call for boycott of our agriculture industry. And that's not something that the industry wants to see happen. Um, that's why everyone is actively looking at how do we use this digital technology to promote transparency in the industries and so on. Um, all in addition to their cost savings. So even cost saving and time saving, it's one of the, of course it's the main benefit, but to a lot of estates, that's not the main thing anymore right now. Yeah. The main thing is the traceability of it. And also of course the reduce of the contact of pesticides to human, that's another big thing. Um, talking a bit, that, that's more on the, of course the spring, but talking a bit more about the analytics. Of course to crunch through hundreds of thousands of hectares of data within short time frame is not easy. Uh, we do have, we have invested in quite a bit of infrastructure and servers to run through it. But the main thing that we've built over the years are um, AI algorithms to help us automatically extract information. So um, we do have a, when we started, obviously when we talk about oil palm plantations, the first thing that the plantations want is how many palm trees they have per area, um, what's the condition of it. And when we started, obviously we didn't have algorithms. What we did was hire 30, 40, 30, 40 uh, part-time students, and everyone was sitting in the room doing manual counting. And that was the basis of our data labeling process. Mm -hmm. So right now, because of that kind of cycle that we went through, we have about 60 million data points of oil pump, and that forms the basis of our algorithms, where we right now have an algorithm that we are confidently able to promise our clients 99.5% accuracy in terms of their counting and labeling. So that's one of our unique kind of proposition because to the farmers, um, inaccurate data is obviously not good because it gives wrong indication of what's happening on the ground and they would want ideally 100% but practically 100% is never possible. Yeah. Yeah. True. So that's where we are able to promise and differentiate ourselves. Um, this kind of algorithm is extremely important uh, to have a database like that because um, it helps the industry as a whole. If you look at the United States, they have they are probably one of the most forefront in terms of digital adoption in agriculture technology. So satellite mapping, drone mapping in US is huge over there. And they have huge database of corn, of wheat, and so on, that they are able to perform very precise analytics. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, in ASEAN region, we are still on the very beginning of this stage of collecting this huge amount of information. And we need to collect this information before we can come up with proper tools and proper analytics that is relevant to the industry itself. Yeah. Thanks, GX. Uh, now, of course, it's not about just productivity. You also talk about analytics, uh, data. This, now, for a farmer who may not know the importance of data, there's, mm -hmm. there's a say that uh, data is the next oil. It's all about data because data will monitor how much you're going to spend, how much you're going to produce, how much you're going to save. Right? Uh, that will eventually boost the digital economy of the country. Right. Now, yeah. every farmer adopts that. Yeah, that's very, so very just simple. to share like what we've been doing in Thailand as well, because in Thailand, there is a lot of smallholders as well as when we're talking about paddy and rice. Um, in addition to that, sugar and cassava is a huge industry over there for agriculture. Um, what we do instead of working directly with the smallholders, which is extremely time consuming and it's hard to get them to understand the benefits of data, obviously, because farmers, smallholder farmers, we are talking about half a hectare, one hectare of data, uh, which doesn't make sense to them. They can go out to the field and look at what's happening. Instead, we work with the mules, the sugar mules, the paddy mules, where to the mule perspective, they want to know exactly what's coming into their estates, um, into their mule, obviously. And that's where we work with them. The mule would then um, procure the service and we will do a map of all the contract farmers and everything under them. And that's where we are able to get scale to adopt the technology and push the technology out. Great. Thanks, thanks, GX. Uh, Razwan, question for you since you're actually looking at the clock, so I'm going to ask you a nice question. No. <laughs> Since, since, okay, I mean, from, from a wide, wide range, right, you have covered telecommunication, oil and gas, energy, and now with the new focus of, of, on agriculture, what do you think are the critical success factors to, to scale drone tech adoption across? Now, you talk about feasibility, uh, which is the cost, sustainability, and scalability. What, from, from uh, uh, Aerodyne's perspective, what would be the critical success factors uh, to scale drone tech across. Let's talk about Malaysia first thing. Okay, All right. So, um, well, as I mentioned earlier, um, doing it in a very large scale is 
um, important. So how do we achieve the very large scale, right? So I guess the question is around how do we scale up our team and then how do we enable the market, right? So um, for us, uh, uh, when we did uh, PADI, one of our key main challenges, the key issues were the battery. <laughs> because mm. we, can, we can only fly about uh, 10 to 15 minutes per charge. And mind you, battery cost is expensive. Yeah? Yes. So with the platform that we use, um, well, at, the point, uh, at this point, we are using still battery technology, battery-based drone. Yeah? So the one that we tested out was um, the XAG P30 Pro. Probably I shouldn't be naming names, but <laughs> but we, we did that, yeah. But um, we use that platform. So the only challenge is battery because um, as uh, because we need to do very large scale. So one team um, has to do about at least twenty hectares per day at minimum, right? Just to make um, the um, cost. Uh, uh, the margin just about right, right, for us to continue operating in this um, sector, right? So at least 20 hectares per day. So per hectare, you know, they have to do a three set of flights. So three set of flights mean three sets of batteries. You know? So that comes about to actually uh, 20 odd ringgits per <laughs> hectare uh -huh. just on battery alone, you know. So mm -hmm. those are um, uh, one of the findings that we found. Battery um, technology is still, I guess it's it's nascent. You know, it's a promising thing, but still early stage. I guess, you know, we just had don't have the power density much at this at this point of uh, our time. I guess, yeah. So and then of course we um, try uh, um, to uh, with with a different platform, meaning you know apart from um, using battery, what 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 else do we use, right? So. Um, so uh, at this point, it, it uh, seems more economical to use hybrid or petrol-based drone. So um, of course, it has its own impact. I'm sure Jing, uh, Jack will probably want to share or give his thoughts. But you know, um, at at least on uh, cost of uh, operations, uh, it it looks uh, better. Right, so we've tested, you know, so it, it, it really can run about uh, longer at least. So it, that help us in terms of uh, managing our batteries, you know, managing the power requirements for the operations, you know. So, but those are one of the challenges. We hope, you know, Tony Stark is real. You know, we really want to have the arc reactor on his chest to be powered on the drone. <laughs> The technology is, um, uh, we still have uh, about what, 10 to 15 minutes flight time and all this. So we are currently, uh, you know, exploring one, one of our other few things, few platforms. So, uh, yeah, so to do it at scale, meaning you can achieve that um, hectare, you know, um, you achieve that size of uh, operations, size of productivity per hectare and all that. Um, and, and uh, I think winning hearts and winning minds, I think we are Malaysians, particularly even, uh, uh, at farmers level, they are also very open with technology. Um, they are uh, very excited even um, to try um, this drone technology. So in terms of winning hearts and minds, I think we are there. So there's not much pushback in terms of you know, getting people to use or to try this technology or getting the demands in, I think it's a uh, low barrier. Um, but another uh, set of challenge is actually the regulatory environment as well. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, for, uh, for us to be able to fly at this moment, we still need to go through um, CAM approval and all that. But currently we are, you know, uh, in discussion as well with CAM. How do we enable agriculture? You know, we cannot like, uh, Every time we want to fly on in a party fields, we need to submit an application to CAM. So how do we make it more um, more friendly to um, uh, to industry players like us? You know, to be able to provide the services to um, our users, right? So um, yeah, so uh, so uh, yeah, so one is in terms of 
other technologies like I think Jax and also Randall said, I think we have achieved that certain complexities or, you know, certain changihness in terms of our sensors, you know, the drone system, it's precise and all that, you know, it's all good. I think um, um, technology barrier is low, at, at least at that point of view. Um, but of course, um, the power, uh, the, the battery is still an issue. Regulatory um, is also an issue. Um, and, and also, what, what else? Um, you know, so th those are, I think, uh, main issues that, that, that we are facing right now. Yeah? Probably, Jax, you want to pitch in something about Yeah, that? I think if you look at the technology of agriculture sprayers, right, this originated from China. So there's no doubt China is the king for agriculture spraying by a long shot. And if you look at the ecosystem in China, um, they are not really using hybrid drone. Mm. And there is a reason why they're not using it. Um, first, and I would say foremost, it's that having a generator on board that needs to power something that flies at 30, 40 kilos um, tends to break down quite often. So there has been a lot of reports from farmers that we, we partners with. Um, they bring the drone out to the day feel they're expecting a whole day of work and then the motor doesn't run. Right. So that they waste the whole day and that's a big cost uh, on top of the battery, obviously. Um, sure. First, you need, that's where um, you need a proper MRO and so on, um, which at the moment, I would say the industry hasn't matured to that stage yet, which is why we don't see a lot of people using. Generator. Of course, the cost benefit, if you think about it, it's really good uh, compared to using batteries. That's another reason why uh, I would say in Malaysia, we see a higher cost benefit is because we don't have local manufacturing of batteries in Malaysia for LiPo or lithium ion batteries. So of course, when you import in the batteries, the raw material of what, um, if you follow, legally speaking, there is a 10% SST. And then on top of that, you have your 25% tax on duty of batteries. So that's 35% extra cost on top of batteries, which quickly becomes unreasonable when we talk about implying it to farmer and so on. Um, so yeah, that's the one main thing that we see. Uh, of course, we are looking right now actively to partner up with a battery manufacturer in China and Malaysia as well to bring large-scale battery manufacturing into Malaysia. So of course, that would happen only with if we hit enough volume. And we're talking about thousands of units of batteries per month kind of volume, which the industry cannot support right now. Mm. So that's a challenge that we are looking at ways to overcome. We're talking to MIDA um, to see how they can facilitate this initial investment to bring down these costs. Um, second one about regulatory, right? You rightly mentioned. Theoretically, right now, all agriculture drones above 20 kilos that are flying, it's probably illegal, if you yeah. want to, strictly speaking. I don't because you see. need, yeah. <laughs> because you, to fly anything above 20 kilos, you yeah. need a private pilot license, which oh. I can confidently say not many people have it yep, that yep. are operating roads. So civil aviation knows about it and they know that they cannot, they are very positive and open about this. Yeah. Um, they are trying to facilitate this, so that's good. I met up with Captain Chester, the CEO of CAM last week, and the two road task force, they all understand what's the problem and the pain in the industry. Um, but from their concern, of course, they have their concern in terms of safety uh, regulations, where imagine if there are companies that are doing low flying crop dusting planes, and a drone flies into their pathway, that's going to be a disaster. Yes, yes, yes. So that's where they need to, and they're working out um, through this NTIS, which I think Aerodyne and us, we're both involved in this. Um, yes, yes. Civil Aviation, they are looking at how do they set up sandboxes, where in certain areas where they know there is no low altitude flying planes, we could have exemptions to fly there without, um, hopefully without permits, or um, if you can prove that we are operating in a safe manner, then we can get exemptions from this. Especially with buddy, you know, we, you don't have to really fly high. It's just Correct. Two, to two point five meter at yeah. most. You know, so it's very low altitude. Yeah. Flight. So the concern that they had was from a aviation training school in Qatar, where because when they are training pilots to fly crop dusters, they do simulated crash landing on paddy field, and right. there was a close miss apparently where the when they were doing a simulated crash landing, the drone flew into the same plot of the area which then cause a huge problem. Oh so that's what they are trying to prevent because from civil aviation perspective, they, they were very open. They said they didn't want to stifle the industry, but all you need is one accident to happen. Hopefully it never happens, but all you need is one and there will be probably be a blanket ban on the whole industry in Malaysia, which of course is not what 
we or anyone in the drone industry wants to see happen. So that's why we are actively talking to them, investing in it, and we are taking it extremely seriously because this would, in one switch, could bring down the whole industry in one accident happens. And that's one thing that we, we never want to see happening. True. I mean, regulations are there, uh, of course, a challenge, but uh, then it's mainly for the safety precautions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Randall, my last question to you guys, uh, a 30 minutes uh, pitch, actually. Now, let's say if you were to tell Malaysians who want to go into drone tech or to people who want to venture into drone technology, what would be your, your say to them? It could be the younger generation, it could be farmers. Uh, you have 30 seconds. Sure. I think it's definitely something that's important. Uh, Malaysia is hungry for, for new blood in every sector, really. Agriculture, construction, IT, whatever you want to name it. And I think um, it is an industry that will provide a long-term career for many. And it's going to be something which can add value to many sectors. So it's a career that is not just fulfilling um, for the young people interested in looking at jobs in, uh, in the drone industry, but also as a pilot or as a MRO uh, specialist. These are things which uh, definitely bring value. Um, and I think right now, the things that we need, that the industry does need, is stuff like data analysts, AI specialists, uh, programmers who specialize in maintaining sort of the algorithms and the intelligence of drones to make them better and just constantly improve them. Especially, specifically here in Malaysia. Wonderful. You actually made it 30 seconds. I have to say, bro, again. <laughs> Jack, now you have, I mean, you guys are the subject matter experts in, in your areas. Uh, palm oil, paddy, and, and extraction, oil and gas. Now, what would you be your say to, to Malaysians who want to enter the drone tech? Um, I would say just start now and don't wait. That's it. Wonderful. You see, uh, now, there are some Malaysians especially parents, right, who are concerned of getting their kids to do drone technology as a work. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a typical mindset, but again, yep. it, it may be wrong because if you want to try something, you better yep. try it now. Yep. Because just try it. If you don't try it, you have regrets. So exactly. live life without regrets and just try it. Lah. Exactly. Plus, MCU has also told Malaysia, let's talk about Malaysia per se, that digital plays a very, very important role. See, last time you have to go physical meetings. Now it's all uh, digital. You have to monitor. Last time you have to go on site. You have to spray. Now it's all digital. So the importance of digital is becoming extremely crucial, especially during MCU. And MCU is going to be here for some time. So with that, uh, Razwan, your say to Malaysians, especially the younger generation and farmers. I think this is the uh, jobs of the future, right? So um, it's not just about drone, you know, it's about AI, it's about machine learning, it's about, um, you know, um, offering that kind of value, right? So it's time for us to create a value on our own. Malaysians need to be championed and drone is definitely one of the key areas, one of the areas that we can really be excellent at, right? So it's just depending on your creativity, right? It's depending on your critical thinking, you know, and drone is rightfully, is the right tool these days, the right tool now for you to be able to come up with your own uh, product or your own, uh, what do you call this, uh, arts, right, you know. Wonderful. Now, with that, uh, on behalf of the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, my utmost humble thanks to uh, Randall, uh, uh, to JX and to Razwan, our esteemed partners from Paladrone, uh, Mata Aerotech, and also Aerodyne. Uh, I'm just going to end up with Razwan saying, if you want to venture into drone tech, the time is now. If you want to go into digital, the time is now. Uh, very happy that our partners in the drone tech are doing something great. But again, MDEC would like to affirm that we, we would love to walk the journey together with you empowering drone tech across sectors in today's topic would be the agriculture sector. So with that, thank you so much to all the Malaysians. Drone tech is the way. So signing off from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.